Does it say it's recording now or something? It didn't say anything, but I think it is. It says it's recording. Yes, it's recording. That means I should talk. Oh, please. Well, okay. Thanks for joining everyone. And uh, Mocha was nice enough to uh, host this call. I just wanted to kind of switch things up a bit. She and Ray and I work together. And uh, so I thought she could host it through her account, whatever. <laughs> just that's the way it looks right now. So, and next week, maybe the same thing. I'm traveling um, during the week and I'm going to be out of state, but I intend to be available and also uh, doing this call. So that's on Thursday at seven again. But uh, today I thought we'd just go over some typical uh, questions and maybe we can have a Q&A. Uh, and it's a kind of important because some of you are pretty smart, uh, but you're getting hung up in some details and you're being a little too pedantic. I like to use that word. Um, so anyways, I have years of videos talking about these different subjects at aceofcoins.club. And then uh, aceofcoins.com is a way to get your name on my calendar and schedule time with me. And then also, um, you know, set up a one-on-one a -on -one consultation, all right? So I still do that. And uh, so I have these Thursday evening calls and I try to pick subjects that um, would factor into what most people are trying to do. Or if I find that there's a trend where like, for example, if y'all are talking about FinCEN, BOI, I'm gonna talk about that again. That hasn't come up too much lately. What do we got here for the chats? Um, okay. Right, Coinbase and Chase are instigators that cause us to be. <laughs> okay, let's blame them. All right. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, look, this is a war. Okay. There's no legitimate reason for what Coinbase is doing with new applicants, except just to frustrate you. So don't let them do it. Just do it. Just go fully through it. Just push your way through it. Okay. Don't let them push you around. Right. This is a bunch of adults. Right. We're in an adult world and they want to, they're just a group of people that want to push you around. That's all it is. It's just like the super rich people want more. OK, well, I, I can understand that, but they it's not that they just want more. What they do is they, they want us to have less. So that's why you see the disappearing middle class. Mm. I don't understand how that serves them, though. But anyways, because you need customers. <laughs> it's so silly. I don't know. Maybe they just are, want to be mean to a certain aspect of our society. But anyways, uh, so so what I want to go over is I'm going to start with one of the um, my uh, telegram communications here. So this gentleman is asking me, he's, he's a client for a while, and he's asking me, John, what happens when the IRS sends me a letter for my missing uphold 1099? So he got a 1099 that was erroneous from uphold, right? The crypto exchange. And I always tell them, just exclude it, okay? Sometimes I'll do a request for a letter ruling. I mean, a determination letter with the IRS. And I have, I have modified the way I do it so they don't route it to the wrong place because they started pulling that on my clients. <laughs> so anyway, anyways, it's so stupid. So anyways, um, but he's asking me, what happens when the IRS sends me a letter for my missing uphold 1099 after I filed my taxes? And, and so he says, he's saying, well... I will have to, all I will have is a response from the IRS based on a redacted 1099. How is that going to help me prove to them that my specific case, this 1099 that is missing is erroneous? Okay, well, there's a lot of assumptions there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, you haven't gotten a letter yet. Right. Let me just describe for you generally how the IRS does things. So if you, okay, in this situation, a 1099, if you exclude from your 1040, Generally, it's going to be your your underreporting. That's how the IRS phrases it. And what they'll do is they'll do an examination of your tax return. Don't get scared. Everyone's scared of an audit. Many times, audits take place and you don't even know it. Many times, audits take place and you get money back because they do they select your a file at random. So an audit or examination may take place in which will result in a, you getting a letter saying, "Hey, we think you underreported. If you think we're wrong, let us know." Thank you. That's very easy to do. So you write back and explain. I excluded this because it's erroneous and uh, so forth and so on, right? So, but he's asking me to tell him how I would respond to something he's not received yet. So please know that I still am human being and I have the same faculties as most of you, okay? And I cannot see the future and I cannot read the mind of somebody in government and I have no idea what's gonna happen in the future. <laughs> So uh, realistically, though, I mean, seriously, um, 
if you're going to exclude a 1099, this it, so far when I've told people to do this, I've not seen a problem. Now I imagine there's there will be something coming up. Like there's going to be something. Someone's gonna, like someone's going to get audited. Okay, fine. That's okay. You're not doing anything wrong. And yes, and no, it's annoying, but it's okay. So for so many years, like since the or the late '90s and the early 2000s, uh, I've had so many debt collection cases, tens of thousands. I'm not exaggerating, tens of thousands. We're in the 30, 40 thousand cases range. And when someone doesn't pay his credit card bills or a debt collector, he, they get a 1099. But the 1099 is wrong for many reasons. I'm not going to get into. So because it's wrong, I'm not going to argue with the IRS. I'm not going to argue with anybody. In fact, the IRS doesn't argue with you. What happens is. We just exclude the 1099 from the 1040. So what's happening is when you don't pay a, a, a debt, it's considered imputed income, which is taxable legitimately. But the only time that's true is if you had a, a, a settlement arrangement and then you failed to fulfill it. You had a new contract and you failed to fulfill it or some other condition, right? So it's erroneous and it does not have to be included in your 1040. And the IRS knows this. And I happen to know because I talked to many professionals, other professionals, and they're explaining there's a couple of letter rulings that the IRS bases its policy on. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get into too much. So for tens of thousands of times over the years, for several decades, I've advised people not to include the 1099s from creditors and debt collectors. And I have never, never, never seen a problem with that, where the IRS sends a letter saying under under reporting. Didn't even start there, which it could have, which is easily solvable because there's a couple... There's a couple letter rulings that we would rely on and the IRS uh, would just say, okay, fine. Okay. Do you think that's the same for Canada? Uh, probably. I don't know what the Canadian's policy, I don't know how the mm -hmm. Revenue Canada works, but I can imagine, I think that IRS is Revenue Canada. I think it's the same. So I think they're using the same software. I don't know. They probably have a different operations manual. Uh, but uh, I couldn't tell you. It could be different. But I just know that in the States, it works this way. There was a couple of letter rulings in the 90s. Letter rulings, uh, they're not supposed to affect everybody, but they can be used as a standard. And especially they can be used in tax court. It's almost like a, it's almost like a, a case law, okay? A letter ruling. So anyways, I'm just saying that as an example. So when so far that I've asked, I've suggested that people exclude the 1099, you're probably not gonna hear anything. But if you do, so what? It's easy, easily explained. And if you have that situation, please let me know. But I can't, I can't respond if if you you don't have the letter yet. You know, um, there is an exception. I had uh, one client who just really, really wanted to be, wanted to report the ten ninety nine. And there, by the way, there is an accounting function that you can use both in cryptos with your ten ninety nine and with an imputed income from debt. Okay, non paying debt. You can include it on your ten forty, and then you can back it out with an accounting function. I don't even know what that is, but I know people that know how to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to have you do that. It's, it's costing you time and money. You don't need to do that. But anyways, I did have a client that did all that and he actually filled out all the correct forms. He got the correct uh, tax advice and he reported the imputed income and then he had it redacted or not redacted, but removed from the tax liability as if he did not include it. So it was just a more formal way to do it. And he came up with the same result as everybody else. And it cost him probably $1,500 to do that. So I'm just trying to save you all some time and money. But anyways, um, understand that the 1099 can be erroneous and it can be excluded for that reason. And why is it erroneous? It's like we, we discussed before on the exchanges, uh, as long as you're not going to dispose of the property, which happens to be cryptos, it could be gold, it could be sand, it could be anything. If, if you don't dispose of the property for dollars, then any 1099 that's, that says you disposed of it and you didn't, meaning that you still care about it, well, then it's erroneous. So how do we how do we express that to the IRS? Well, generally, on the exchange, the exchange is the owner of the cryptos the whole time. So if you're moving from coin to coin, and they know this, they just want, if you tell them, if you show that you know this also, then they're going to say, okay, fine. He knows mm -hmm. <laughs> because it has to work that way. That's how the software works. That's how the blockchain technology actually functions. It makes a third party, the trustee, that's just how it works. So the fact that it was traded all over and now it's worth more dollars, that doesn't create a tax liability. So if you didn't sell for dollars, meaning that there's not an adverse party that took the ownership of the key, the private keys, and then gave you dollars for it, if that didn't happen, 
Well, then there's no sale and there's no gain and there's no disposition of assets, right? That's how it works. So, but but if you just exclude it from your 1040, okay, you'll be fine. Um, any questions on that? I have one, John. Right. It's Karen. Um, so what if you got an uh, 1099 for an IRA distribution that was actually one of those self-directed IRAs? So maybe you hold held precious metals um, and you never told the IRS what you were invested in. Um, would that be a situation where you could exclude the 1099 from your return? Who sent the 1099? The custodian. Okay, well, it's exempt anyways. If you're under the umbrella of the of the IRA. Yeah, so yeah. they distributed the, um, we didn't get along with the custodian for years and they finally decided they didn't want us as clients. And they sent, um, they sent me a big distribution, um, a 1099R, I think. Um, Did you get the dollars? What? Did you get the dollars? It was no, no, because it was a it was a self directed IRA. We had total control over the investments oh, okay. since two thousand eight, and we never changed the valuation on it oh. because we didn't want to tell the IRS what we were invested in. Okay, well, and that's fine. Uh, but it, did you get the gold or? What? Oh yeah, well that's. They all. sent the gold back. No, they didn't have it. We've had it for decades. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, so there's no disposition. <laughs> Yeah, it was just all so on paper. So it's erroneous. Yeah. So it's a similar situation, right? So you have a choice. You can you can account for it and then show why it wasn't taxable. Not because it's exempt. It's just because it didn't result in a disposition of assets. How would that be explained? We would have to tell the IRS. That's okay if you tell them. You didn't want to tell them, but that's okay if you tell them. What are they going to do about it? So you have some gold. So what? Okay. I mean, so if you, imagine if you have, if you have some gold and then you, I, I don't know, I'm not going to make up a scenario like that. It doesn't matter. It's just real simple. Um, it stated the possession of it and the custody of it and the ownership of it never changed. So mm -hmm. that's the definition of no disposition. Okay. The 1099 is where there's a disposition. I would look up the, there's a, a regulatory provision for the 1099 R, but you're going to see that it matches up with what I just said. Okay. R. Yeah. So, so you're saying that it would be a good strategy to leave it off my 1040. I would leave it off. Let, and then let them come back to me. Okay. If the IRS wants to, you'll get a letter and what you can explain. You respond back and say, yeah, here's what happened. Uh, I just want to buy myself time to get some things going because it's, it's, it would be a big tax bill if it was a real tax. Okay. And let's say, okay, I know I'm right on this, but let's just say I'm wrong. Okay. And the IRS says, no, no, you have to, you have to pay. Okay, fine. So it comes up, you come up with that debt. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then don't pay. Just keep mm -hmm. your money. Be uncollectible the whole time. Yeah. Be uncollectible and then run the clock on them. Okay. Yeah, so it doesn't matter if it's a lot of money. In fact, the more money that you owe, the easier it is to get the IRS to say you're uncollectible and leave you alone. Okay. And that's what I do when I try to work out a deal where, where if I have to make a deal with the IRS, if I don't have to make a deal, that means I can make my client uncollectible without question. If I if I cannot do that completely, then I have to make kind of a deal. It depends on my client's needs. Um, if So what I'll try to do is have him file tax returns if he hasn't done yet, I'll, and I'll have him only take standard deductions. Mm -hmm. and at first he thinks I'm an idiot and he goes but I'm going to owe a lot more and I say exactly because we're going to get the IRS to agree that you're uncollectible if you owe less they may not agree that you're uncollectible mm -hmm. the more you owe the better it is with the United States that's the, that's how the United States works when it comes to banks they're the opposite so that's why I say the United States is your best or your friendliest creditor because they base mm -hmm. the, the collection of the debt on your ability to pay it's vastly different than basing it on how much the debt is. Okay. Okay. Well, that helps a lot because just I have taxes it. due on in a couple of weeks or yeah, exclude it. And if you get a letter regarding it, it's called it's part of an examination, or sometimes it's a pre-examination. Sometimes there's a person at the IRS who is 
uh, staging a case possibly for an examination. And so when you get that letter, he'll say, hey, in 30 days, let me know if uh, you know, there's why you're doing this, what happened. And if you send the letter back, it, which is exactly to the instructions, you're, you're going to more than likely get a good, pretty good result. Just keep it real simple. Just, okay. just how, how long do you think it would take for them to send that first letter to me? How long would it? Within the year. Okay. Well, that's good. I, I, yeah, I would love be to timely. buy myself a year. <laughs> I mean, it, it could be longer, but typically it's going to be within the year. Okay. I, I don't know. I mean, if they wait beyond three years, they lose the chance to talk about it. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah, no reason to lose sleep over this stuff and get all stressed out. I know it's it, it could be stressful, but uh, you know it's just paperwork. Someone's not you know threatening your life. I mean, maybe it feels that way, but uh, um, so one of the things that y'all can just interrupt here because I'm just going to go on with something. So somebody was asking me today about um, staking in cryptos, and then when he would incur a tax liability, and he wants to take some of the money out and buy some personal things. So the understanding is that. It's easy to ha have no tax liability legally when you're spending more money. So if you're spending money from an asset by selling some of it for dollars, where we've gone to the effort of making it tax deferred, right? But you wanna buy a car or you wanna buy a motorcycle or a boat or something like that or a house. So there's ways to spend that money from the LLC that doesn't create a tax liability or income for yourself. Um, and so, what you want to realize is when you have the liability, you have the liability when you realize a gain. So if you bought yourself a car from your company that doesn't have a tax liability, the money's sitting out there, right? You made some money in cryptos, the co company did, and it doesn't file return. So it's not being accounted for, but then you take some of that money and you buy yourself a car. Well, okay. If you bought the car, the company paid for the car and you, you take ownership of the car and then you leave it like that, right? And you get it insured and you just go on about your business. Well, eventually the IRS may see that if there's an audit because you got yourself a car. I mean, I don't see that they match them together like that. However, if you were audited, the IRS would ask you, this company bought you a car, but you didn't report that income on your tax return, which is a legit, legitimate question. That That is unreported income paying for something that's a, an expense is income and it doesn't matter where the money came from. So it's your income. It's your, it's your debt. So it's your income. It's your benefit. So it's your income. So how do you, how do you avoid that legally? Well, have the company buy the car. <laughs> you can use it. Companies don't drive cars. You do, right? So have the company buy the car. How do you do that? When you go to the dealer, you say, Hey, where do I send the money? Once you make a contract, right? You can see he might say, write a check or something, write a check from the corporate account or wire the money from the corporate account and tell them one of one or both one or the other of the following. You tell them that the company is buying the car. So title the car in the name of the company. Along that same line, you could do a variation of that. You could say this this company is sending the money over, but we need to title the vehicle in the name of this other company or trust. No problem. He'll do it. Now that's first option. Second option is put the car in your name and then tell the dealer that the money is being sent by your lender and that you need to give your, the company's information so that the, um, the dealership can send the title documents over to the company. That's how it works. So what's going to happen is the dealer is going to show that you're the title holder and the dealer will reflect a lien instrument against the title with the DMV. The dealers do that. Okay, very simple. So if you borrow the money to buy the car, that's not income. And if the company buys the car, it's not your income. You see, pretty simple. So that handles it with, with staking. So it's typically staking, you're gonna make some money. You're gonna have some increase in value if it, it works right. And you're gonna get paid out in the coin you were using. And like I explained before, if it's not dollars, then it's not a taxable thing. Now there is there is some things where you get into bartering, okay? So be careful or paying someone for like, in lieu of wages and dollars, you're gonna compensate them with Bitcoin. The government's going to make the claim that it's still should be reported in terms of dollars. I'm not gonna argue that one because that's easily avoidable. In any case, that's how you do it, okay? Realize when you have the liability, um, 
it's when there's a disposition of the property for dollars and the property could be anything. It could be gold. It could be oil. It could be, uh, it could be cryptographic currency, a coins. It could be a stable coin, stable coins and regular coins are, are not a taxable thing. Only dollars are. So there's no tax on cryptos. There's a tax on dollars always has been. Hey, John, quick question. Oh, yeah. How do you go about moving your crypto that I believe this person saying that they have custody of personally to an LLC? Well, okay. It depends on how you're in possession of the cryptos. If you have cryptos on a wallet, like a paper wallet or a Bitfi or something. Hard wallet. You, yeah, it's a hard wallet. So if it's not with a third party, who cares about the LLC? It doesn't matter. You only use the you only need the LLC when you're dealing with third parties, like an exchange, right? So it doesn't matter. If I want uh, my coins on the balance sheet of an LLC, uh, then I have to. Now this is a situation where I'm going to use my balance sheet to maybe get some financing. Okay, so I would have my crypto coins and my gold and my land and my receivables. Those would be on my balance sheet. And then it would be on a, an accounting, you know, a balance sheet that I can I can do what I want to do with it. I can qualify for lending or something like that. But it's in your possession. So it doesn't matter about the LLC. It's just in your possession. Um, someone's asking, how can you pay employees with crypto without reporting? You can't. If you're using the strict definition of employee, you can't avoid it. Now, I will tell you that 3406, which defines employees, it literally defines what employees are not. But I can tell you after researching it for a very long time, employees are government workers. Mm -hmm. Okay. But <laughs> nobody here is an employee or, or a wage earner unless you're working for Congress or something. But we can't talk about that because it doesn't work that way. They don't let you do that. They, they're going to penalize companies. So uh, if you really have an employee, meaning that he's subject to the, he meets the criteria of what the IRS has defined employment to be, there's like 20 common law principles of employment. For example, he shows up for work every day because you told him that's his schedule. He has the break schedule that you give him and he does what you tell him every day. That's an employee. Okay. The guy that paints your house, not an employee. He could be, but typically he's not. All right. So uh, the guy that paints your house, you can pay him in crypto. Now, if the IRS sees that transaction, it would say, oh, you have to do this thing, right? But you could pay him in crypto, just like it's just like cash, okay? So in that situation, it's just like cash. Now, here's the risk you run with paying employees with cryptos. You might have some employee that really, really, really wants withholding. He wants a social security withholding. <laughs> Maybe because he's too young, doesn't know any better. So he's going to make a complaint, right? Or maybe he wants workman's comp or something like that. So you run the risk of the employee, if he's not close to you, I mean, if you just work with people that are close to you, they're not going to care, like your cousin or something, your brother, that's not going to matter. But if it's strangers, maybe they want the wage withholding. So if you don't, he has every right to require you to do it. He can, he can get you in trouble. That's the risk you're running. All right. Hope that helps. But yeah, there, there's, okay, so if you want to look this up, the 20 common law principles of employment, and the same with barter exchanges, you can look in IRS circulars to see what, how they're defining things. But ultimately, there's a question of when there's a disposition of property for dollars. That's when there's a liability. And just so you all know, for the sake of this conversation, not that this is going to factor in, because I don't even use it when I'm working cases, but you should understand that not all income is taxable, Okay. Income, the income tax is very uh, special on uh, taxable activities. And I'll give you a brief example of that. A taxable activity would be something like having an oil rig, uh, paying dividends or receiving dividends, okay? Or being a corporation that pays out dividends. Those are all taxable things. Uh, manufacturing weapons or explosives or hazardous materials. Those are all regulated and taxable things. Gambling winnings. Most of those are taxable. Some are not. And the government, we gave the government that a right to do this, okay? Article 1, Section 8, right? Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the U.S. Constitution. That's where it comes from, not, not uh, the 16th Amendment. There's no new taxing authority that came from the 16th Amendment, if you want to look that up. So 
what is working at the grocery store as a cashier or a store manager? What category is that? Not, not it's not. <laughs> but if you don't fill out a voluntary withholding agreement, mm -hmm. the W-4, somehow it's voluntary, but it's not. <laughs> you get a standard deduction, standard withholding, right? One dependent and all that sort of thing. So I, I'm just telling you, so I've been doing this stuff a long time. And in the 90s, there was a company that was like the hero of everybody because it was hiring people. And it was literally doing the right thing. It was not classifying people as employees, no W-2, stuff like that. And that went on for about six or seven years. And then the IRS just destroyed them financially. And there's never, they didn't do anything wrong. It's just that mm -hmm. the IRS kept auditing them and interfering with their business and things like that. So it just destroyed them. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens. I'm not saying that's right. I'm just right. saying that's the reality of our situation. It's a war on your property. And they got this system to where they, they couldn't bring in the, the taxing system. And they they had been trying to bring it in. I think that's why the, part of the reason why we had the Civil War, the American Civil War, was to bring in the tax system. And it kept getting uh, stricken down in, until they came up with the right idea, which is to trick people into thinking that it's required to participate in some way. And then once they do participate, it creates a liability, which is what we have today. Mm -hmm. It's been around for over 100 years. Very successful that way. Mm -hmm. So, John, would USDC or USDT count as a disposition for dollars? It's not, because can you pay the tax in USDT or USDC? Can you pay the tax in that? That That's the deciding factor, right? Ask yourself this question. Can I pay the tax in the thing that they're saying is taxable? If it's taxable, it's because you disposed of it for dollars, U.S. dollars, not USDT. Even though it's pegged to the dollar, you cannot pay the tax in that stable coin. So therefore, it's not taxable because you're not required to dispose of assets to pay a tax. You might owe a tax, but you're not required to dispose of assets to pay the tax. You're not required to use dollars. As crazy as that sounds. Right? Makes sense? Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, how do you step away from the liability of? Okay, well, you know, here's my very basic. Tax. <laughs> here's a very basic thing of how I do it. So, uh, let's say uh, my brother and I uh, each put up a uh, fifty thousand dollars for uh, some some sort of an investment. Okay, so it it's after tax money. My brother and I have fifty thousand dollars. We put a hundred thousand dollars together into this deal. And six or eight months later, let's say we get our money out. Let's say it's a really interesting deal and we at least get our principal out and then we're maybe we're making returns on it, okay, right? Let's just say we put in 100 collectively and now it's worth 120 at some point in the future. Who cares? A year later, right? It's made 20%, let's just say. So we don't have any, we don't have any protection, but let's just say the both of us have a contract that says, the contract says, that once we put the money into the investment, it's neither of our money. The money is now owned by the both of us together and neither of us have any right mm -hmm. to use the money. This is so important. So if that money makes a gain and it's taxable, profit, 20%, that's taxable. But if neither of us by contract have the right to spend the money, then neither of us have the tax liability. So it's just sitting there. Now, let's say I take some of the money out. Let's say I took out $2,000. So what's my tax liability? I will have a tax liability. So you take the 20% gain, right? And you have your, your 2,000. So what's the percentage, right? You figure that ratio out and then you can calculate the percent tax you owe on that. You will, owe, you will owe a tax. But how do I avoid that? If the both of us together now are a, a unique person with the same contractual rights and we do not have individual adverse rights, we are now one person that does not exist in the eyes of the government. The government can't tax it because it doesn't exist. The association of myself and my brother in, in that contract does not exist. I do. 
that's why it can only the, the liability only is incurred when I have the gain, not when we both have the gain together. We are not a taxpayer. Now we can change that if we both file a joint tax return, which we can do. We can we can say we're a partnership. Then that will create a tax situation, and we will then forever together we will have a tax liability when we do th stuff like that. Mm -hmm. How would I change that? Anybody want to take a stab at that? How would I change that situation if my brother and I started making profits at something and, and we didn't have the tax liability because we never took the profits out? But then we filed a joint tax return and we created the tax liability by doing so. How could we then fix that and go forward and not have a tax liability again? Um, could, yeah, could you add someone some to the partnership? Yes, thank you. Who said that? Clay. Hey. Clayton. Clayton. Yeah, thank it's you. It's been a while. <laughs> I've been around. No, man, that's I've perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. That's right. Change the change the ownership. Now you have a different group. Okay. Now the the two are already toast. Okay, they filed their partnership tax return, but now we have three people. Even though the two that filed the partnership, now there's three people. It's a completely different person. And once again, it doesn't exist. It has legal rights. It just doesn't have a tax liability without creating one <laughs> and so forth and so on. So how do you escape the liability? Well, you can share it within a group that doesn't collectively have a, the same liability. So do you have any thoughts about like finding people who will accept this because like I've tried to get family members in on this and they're like, Oh, my tax advisor says that I have to talk, tell <laughs> oh. them about my trust. And they're, uh, you know, they don't, they're not on these somebody. vibes. So partner with somebody where you have a real business thing going on. Like you're going to do something and, and together and make money. And you guys are like, you know, you're up on it you're talking about it. Yeah. I'm going to do this. We're going to do that. Let's work together. If you try to find a nominee, like your cousin or your brother or something, they're going to think you're trying to cheat the tax system. So, <laughs> The, what I just described was two people just having a contract, okay? The next level of that, which is the far easier thing to do, is to form an LLC where my brother and I are the members. Then it's automatic. It's a matter of law. No one can then test it, needs to test it by looking at the contract, where before they could have, they could have, the IRS could have said, no, we don't think you're a partnership or whatever. They could have done something, right? But if it's a, if it's a statutory creature, no problem. So that's how we're using LLCs. We're, we're divesting our exclusive rights in the property. So to find someone like that, you probably be, be, just want to find a real business partner or somebody that's going to go in with you and that wants to put some money on the table. Maybe you each put up 10 grand and do something, you know? Then, then you know, you can do something like this. Here, here's an example. Let's say you want to go in with somebody and you, you make the deal, you make the arrangement. And then we start getting into this conversation about taxes and you're, you're thinking, I'm going to educate them. No, don't do that. Just tell him what you want to do. And if he, if he doesn't like it or if it looks like he's hesitating, just say, look, what you do is let me contract with your company. And my company will contract with your company. And then we'll have our different tax treatment. Mm -hmm. You can just do it that way, too. I've done that many times where people are so terrified. You know, they're really smart people. They'll just they just want to file tax returns. No problem. It doesn't affect me at all because I, I handle everything differently, you know. So you have a company, he has a company. You partner together, that comp that partnership does not file a return, but when there's disbursement, your partner files his return and you do what you're gonna do. Nobody's uh, nobody's in responsible for the other person. Um, okay. Got a question, I'm not sure I'm gonna, I, I'm, I don't quite understand it. Um, someone's saying that they had a legal order uh, which directed uh, the bank account their personal all right their, their bank account to um remove money from direct deposit so here's yeah. how you here's how you defeat that it's, it's a personal account i'm imagining so it's a personal account and so there's a judgment lien creditor who has a claim against you personally so you can't escape that but what you can do is move your money out of your name <laughs> so like if it's me let's say I, i'm the guy with that suit okay so i'm using a personal bank account where if I want to get out of that situation, risking someone levying my bank account, I'll keep the account open, but I'll put a dollar in there, mm -hmm. right? some minimal amount. And then I'll have my brother and I open another bank account and we're going to use a limited liability company. You have to do it this way with a limited liability company. Mm -hmm. So maybe I need to clear funds in my personal name. 
So the limited liability company is going to be called John Jay or John Jay Singleton or whatever the checks are made out to, right? LLC. So I can clear personal checks or wire transfers in a corporate account if the names match. So that's how I would do it. And the reason why it works is because the, uh, the I, I, it's not my money. It's out of my estate and it's out of his estate. The two people have the LLC and you get charging order protection. The only way a creditor can take the money is if I got paid, if I take it out first. Okay, so that's how you would that's how you would uh, overcome the bank levy. And I'll give you a quick example. I had a call years ago from this one woman. She was a real estate agent and she had a commission out there. It was like $40,000. And um, uh, she had active levies. Like she had like three bank accounts and the IRS had frozen all of them. <laughs> So she needed to clear the funds. And if she went, if she cleared the funds, they'll just take it. I mean, they had active levies, ding, 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 ding. So what we did, simply did is I had she and her daughter open up an LLC account. And I think I had her daughter sign for it. It could have been both or one of them, but I chose her daughter or both of them, I forget. And so I named the LLC, the woman's name. And then I put, I had the bank. Now there's a couple of ver versions you can do on this. You can do, John Smith LLC, or you can say John Smith LLC doing business as John Smith, whatever the bank will accept. You want to clear funds made payable to John Smith. And so that's what I did for her. And here's the irony. So we had the account set up. We went to the same bank where she was already like Bank of America, for example. Her accounts were frozen by the IRS. We went back to Bank of America, opened up the LLC account, deposited the funds, cleared them, and she moved them out of the bank. Didn't touch them. IRS didn't touch them at the same bank. This is how powerful it is. So what, what, let me describe what I'm doing and let me point you, point you in some direction here. Uh, look at the tax code for the, how this works. Ironically, title 26 USC section 6331A. Let's do a share screen. If you can find it, can you find it real quick? This is very important. It's so subtle, but it changes everything. Well, I think I should make you host. Okay. Do I have to agree to something or click on something? No, I just got to find you. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Da, 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 da. I put title. I put a link in the chat if that's helpful. Oh, okay. I can share screen. Hang on. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, share having... screen with that link. Oh wait. Uh, I just found it. So okay. I, okay. I'll share screen. Either way. All right. Okay. One second. Thanks, Karen. All right. Give me a second to not be an idiot. Uh... Okay, here it is. All right. Do you see it? Let's go down there. 6331. Yeah, income taxes, subtitle A. 6331. No, I'm sorry. You got it. Subtitle F. 6331. Uh, where is it? You can search on it. Oh, I thought you said she had the link. All right, section. Maybe I can yeah, add this. 6331. Yep. Title 26. Look, did it give it to you? No. Title it, title, it care title, put it in there. Levy and distraint. Yeah, title levy and distraint. Well, it didn't USC. come up. So <laughs> title 26 section. USC. Okay. 6331. I don't know. She put it in there. Okay. You can do that way. I'll put it in there. Okay, let's read it. Okay, read the first line. If any person liable to pay neglects or refuses to pay, you get notice and demand. It shall be lawful for the secretary to collect the tax and other fees by levy. This is so important. This, this tells you everything. By levy upon all property 
and rights to property. What? If I have the exclusive right to some property, the government can take it. Well, how do I use property so that I don't have the exclusive rights? I form an LLC, open a bank account, add a partner in there, and put some cash in there. Even the IRS won't touch it because of this rule right here. Because mm. why? I have divested my exclusive rights over the property. So therefore, if I don't have the rights to the property, the IRS can't take it because the IRS can't take anything that I don't have. The IRS can only take something that I have. Let me show you how this works the other way around. The true story. I had a, a one client. She had, was using a stupid trust. It was wrong. And she was using it in an abusive way. So I don't care. <laughs> I was trying to get her money back, right? So the IRS levied the money in the trust for her personal 1040 tax liability. So I had her appoint me as trustee and resign. And then I filed a claim for refund, 843, form 843. With the IRS and I said, the trust is not responsible for the payment of this woman's tax obligations. The IRS sent the money back. Then I resigned and appointed her and left. That was the end of it. So that just it shows you how powerful that is. The IRS can only take what the taxpayer has the right to spend or sell. That's why you hear me say that a lot. That comes from 6331. Everything I'm doing comes from that. And that's why I say, if I change my property rights, I can defeat that statute legally. They can see it, but they can't touch it. How else can I do that? There's other ways, but the LLC is the best one. What, what, what do you want to ask, Will? Hello. Yeah, I, I don't know if my father followed up on it, but he just went through a terrible divorce and... Um, you know, she was with him for a while, so um, she does. You know, deserved a half Texas, whatever. But she got more than half, and I was pissed off because I listened to you, and um, I I know about what you say about you know uh, marriage, divorce, and all that. Uh, so I told him to give you a call because it's it's after the fact. But what struck me was the judge ordered him to be responsible for the mortgage that they're both on and she's no longer uh, liable according to the divorce decree he must pay her more than half of the equity um and made him sign a note payable to that effect to evidence the debt then he said if he was he hasn't paid it by the end of october then he has to sell the house through a real estate agent. So I just wanted to <laughs> share that with you. Like I was like, I call mean, John Jay. So I many, don't know. So many now. things that this is completely out of your mind. I mean, these judges are they lost it. Okay. First of all, doing that requires competence. So the judge is requiring that he be competent to make the mortgage payments. Think about it. Can a child figure out how to make the mortgage payments? No, adults know how to do that stuff. They figure it out. So that requires competence. So the judge is required to be competent. How can he do that? Andy's elderly. So um, his, okay. I mean, he had a lawyer, so ben, they failed okay, him. Look, but... If the judge had the authority to, to do this, then he- He could... would have to be incompetent. Well, what you're saying, John, court, that he can only make you do it if you're incompetent. So no, I mean, no, 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 no. So the judge is okay. Look, there's so many things. Look, the judge is saying you have to keep on making the mortgage payments. That requires competence to do that. Go out in the world, make some money, pay, make the mortgage payments. How can the judge require someone to be competent? What my point is, he can't. Check this out. If the judge says you have to sell your house, can he require someone to buy it? then how can he require him to sell it? That tells you right there he doesn't have the authority. Mm. That's why he's telling him to do it. Right. And he's threatening him with contempt if he doesn't. So that's the definition of you can't have an agreement. You mm. can never reach an agreement if you are being have a gun to your head. It's just like that case we saw the other day where the stupid ass attorneys are telling people, you must, you're required to sign this contract. Right, right, right. That's the definition of no agreement. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Right.
if you didn't have the authority already to screw you. I don't have to do mm -hmm. anything. Right. And the lawyer literally so, said, so, you have to do this. So mm -hmm. can he hold them in contempt, someone, though? Can a judge yes. require like, someone? And he will. Can a judge require someone to lend you money on your property for any reason? Some of these judges seem insane with the contempt thing, though. Like, out of their mind. They've, anyway. they've gotten. They've been doing it for decades, with it. and we let yeah. them mm -hmm. and out of their minds. And now they're they, out of control. This is completely outside of the their authority. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I want to talk to him. He's probably going to be really be angry. After that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if he didn't call you, that's on him. Uh, right. I gave him your link. But I just like to add that I found it interesting because I read the divorce decree. And it said if he doesn't pay her by the end of October, then it's going to be well, 6% per annum. Whatever, whatever. So I was if like, I'm, if I'm him, I understand the judge says, give me, he's telling me to give me, give him my house or go to jail. So I'm going to run my ass down to the county recorder's office and file a quit claim deed and give it to the judge. <laughs> See how fast he's off that case. And how's he going to explain that to the chief judge? But your honor, I thought that he said if I didn't give him my house, I would go to jail. Well, that's reasonable for me to understand that under the circumstances. Whoa. It's a big that's... problem for the judge. That's like a career ender. Damn. Okay. Thank give you. him the house. Deed it over to him. See how he likes that. Now he mm. can't run the case anymore. Okay. I mean, I'm just don't don't tell him to go do that. I'm just saying <laughs> no, there's a lot more to it, I right? Kinda... But you gotta think. You gotta think the we stuff were, through. Yeah, we were on the quick claim part, but I told him that before I even got. Give to it that to point. the judge in his personal individual name. Woo! Good gracious. Keep your name okay. on the title. <laughs> Take the wife off. Give it to him. That's that's what it was about. They wanted they wanted her name off the thing, um, oh. off the house. I and mean, there's more. There's more. Yeah. But, but he yeah, yeah, that's just like. He has to understand that he's going through a receivership and it's not over. Okay. Even if that what you're describing, you're at that stage right now, it's just the beginning. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's just a receivership. It's an involuntary receivership. It's not a, a, a divorce. Proceeding. Yeah. So the question wow. is, and people are like, what? <laughs> so what can be done after judgment? I guess this is one of the things you're saying. And it says, literally, are you saying give the judge a notarized quick claim deed and record it? Is that yeah, what give you are house. saying? Yes. Give him the house. Yeah. Give and the house. do they have to accept the claim? Don't they have to accept yeah, the Yeah, you can give him the house. What's he going to do? What's no, he going to do? You can just deed it over to him. And just your your understanding is that he told you to do it or you'd be arrested. And if they go, to, it's too late now. When they say, oh, no, we didn't mean that. I didn't mean, too late. You already own my house. And now you have an interest in this case. And fuck you. Mm-hmm. And then would you write an easement so you stay in the house? There's more to do. There's more. <laughs> I know everybody's yeah, like, how I, does I, it I all work? About all that. I totally think about, about this. all of that. If there's if, they, if there's a if there's a petition for the a dissolution of a marriage, mm -hmm. what is that? What type of action is that? Is that a tort claim? Is that a suit for damages? No. Declaratory. It's, yeah, it's a declaratory judgment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in a, a case Ooh, where I divorced you, I divorced you, I divorced you. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, well, in the case where the pleading, it sets the jurisdiction of the court. So the judge has the authority to uh, declare something to exist or not exist. So you're asking for the judge for declaratory relief. Mm -hmm. to declare the dissolution of a marriage. And so you, come pleading, pleading, you come into the court with the pleading and the pleading says that. And the answer says, yeah, I guess she doesn't love me anymore. So, yeah, okay. And the judge says, okay, I'm going to grant your divorce. Have a nice day. That should be the end of it. Mm -hmm. They have no business to use a petition that seeks a very limited scope of jurisdiction to declare something to be or not to be. There, There's no jurisdiction given to then liquidate you. The, the, the court can't talk about money. They can only just sit, have a hearing and say, do you guys really want to get divorced? Okay. Did you go through some counseling or something? Okay. Okay, I'm going to declare it. So what's he doing? You're asking the court to use public records to announce the dissolution of a marriage. Why? Well, that's how the marriage was formed. You announced it to all your friends, and that's what makes a marriage. That's part of the process, right? It's a ceremony. It takes sometimes months. Mm -hmm. So to undo that, you have to announce it to the public. Why? Because other people are affected. Right. 
But if yeah. none of their damn business, what you're doing in the marriage. Right, <laughs> and aren't they also using this idea of the marital estate? Okay, and but so that, there's that, but look what, so there was already an arrangement before the this before the divorce. There's already an arrangement to to use the money in the marital community, as as Mo was saying. There's an arrangement to take care of the needs of the people in the family. What who came up with 50-50? Mm -hmm. That's so arbitrary and 50 mm -hmm. and 40, 60, whatever. But I'm just saying, what what's 50-50? How is that equitable? It wasn't that wasn't how we were serving everyone's needs before. In fact, I think it's so complicated. We'll never be able to calculate what percentage was what because when the money came in the door, we did this thing with it and that thing and then this thing. And then who are you to tell me that it says be 50-50? That destroys everything. And the function of the court, the obligation of the court is to preserve the status quo. How do you do that? You go back and look at the arrangements that were already existing. That's called the balance of the equities. Mm -hmm. the court failed to do that. Moreover, the court also failed to, well, the court imposed a condition of duress mm -hmm. on everybody, but on the husband, mm -hmm. such that if he didn't go along with whatever, do what he was told, then the judge would hold him in contempt, meaning go to jail or pay attorney fees or something like that. Or both. And his attorney, if he has one, he probably has one. His attorney says, oh, you better do what the judge says. <laughs> Why? Because the judge doesn't have authority otherwise. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, so what's what's happening is there, like Moko said, there's an involuntary receivership. And so when there's a receivership, what does that look like? Okay, let's say you file the Chapter 13 bankruptcy, right? So there's a petitioner. In a, in a voluntary bankruptcy, that is a, the a debtor. And so the debtor says, I, I don't know what to do with all this debt. I need protection from the United States government. And the government has a standing order of injunctive relief against every creditor on the earth, literally. So you file for Chapter 13 protection, and the United States says, sure, we'll help you. you got to do the following, and then give them a reorganization plan, right? So the petitioner is the debtor. He has to disclose his identity. He has to be the debtor. He has to have a list of creditors, some of which have a perfected security interest, some of which have collateral, right? They've collateralized loans to this uh, debtor, okay? That's okay. So we know this is bankruptcy, but you should understand that it's receivership. Now receivership predates our, our legal framework. Receivership predates the American Indians that were here. Think about it. When when a family lost the breadwinner, the, the hunter, right? The, who's gonna take care of the children and the wife? The other people, what do they have to do? Liquidate the property so they can, they can compensate everyone and, and make sure that kind of absorb that family into the community, right? This is a receivership, it's very useful. But right now it's being used for very evil purposes. So what the, our government has done is statutorize receivership. And it makes sense. That way you can train people to be practitioners and administer bankruptcies. But what your family court is doing is it is imposing an involuntary receivership on your property, whereas your marital community would be the debtor. Mm -hmm. You see, it's as involuntary. Yes, if, if it had debt, yeah. That, okay, so an, a, you can file, you can do a bankruptcy a couple of ways. The debtor can ask for the bankruptcy and ask mm -hmm. for help, right? Or the creditors can go mm -hmm. to a receiver or a court to appoint a receiver mm -hmm. and say, we all are the creditors and we want to take his stuff and divvy it up. So do it, do it through the court. So that way we're not fighting in the street, right? Well, there has to be a debtor and, and or a debtor in possession. So who is that? If there's a divorce petition, is it the husband and wife? Or is it the party, uh, the, the spouse who has all the money? <laughs> well, it's supposed to be the marital community. Think about this. When, where do we have underwriting where the banks will lend to the marital community? Never. There isn't any underwriting. They, they lend to the husband and the wife jointly, right? There is no, uh, no marital community. The banks don't recognize this. <clears throat> so how do you conduct a receivership on the marital estate when that is without the cognizance of the court? <laughs> you see how deep this gets? Yeah. That's so deep. Thank you. It's so far yeah. out. You guys are so far out. I mean, here's what you need to do. You pull the judge's immunity and file a petition to appoint a receivership and, and liquidate the judge. See how he likes it. Right. <laughs>
I'm not joking. Liquidate right. the judge. And even if it gets dismissed or something, it's going to wake his ass up. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. I could be liquidated, too. Because one time you're going to get through. You're going to liquidate him. And it's going to be and make the news and it's going to go through the whole community. And they're going to go, oh, shit, they figured this out. We need to start liquidating these judges and the lawyers, too. Mm -hmm. The better way to do it is you liquidate one of the lawyers. Just liquidate them. File a petition for receivership. What, what's going to happen is the lawyer, he's going to be thrown under the bus. They're not going to help each other. <laughs> so you go after the weak link. Thank you. Thank you for discussing that. Uh, yeah. the, the lawyer was definitely the weak link. So you, what do you, what do you liquidate? Mean by liquidate, John? Like okay, liqu liquidate means like this. So like he's like Will's describing. The judge says we're going to sell your house, right? Well, that means okay. So you're the title holder, but you don't want to sell your house. But the judge says, "I'm going to sell your house, or I'm going to make you sell it, or you're going to go to jail." Uh, go to jail. Okay. So what they'll do is they'll list it for sale through a listing agent, and sell it without your permission and without you signing the contract to sell your house. So they broke the chain of title. Mm -hmm. But because the judge issues an order that so that's supposed to be good because no one's challenging it, no one knows how to challenge that broken chain mm -hmm. of title. Make an insurance claim against the title insurance company. That would really teach him a lesson. Oh, you want to break the chain of title? Okay, I'll make an insurance claim on it. But the new title holder has to do that because he has he has a he has damaged property. Okay, the broken chain of title. You see. So how does that work? The receiver, like I said, is outside the framework of our government. So it, it's wild west. He can just sell your house. He can go and he, he, banks know this. Make a phone call to the banks. And they'll just give up all the money to him and he'll put the money into a trust account and he'll do whatever he damn well pleases with it with no oversight. Because there's no title. There's no legit title anymore. They'll just break everything. They'll break the chain of title. And I don't care if the and judge. So how do you live? So you're using that same hammer against the judge or the. Or we the, haven't done that yet. You're saying I'm, I'm looking at. Uh, yeah, we haven't done that yet, but we should. And, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to start showing people how to do this. But how would the title insurance company react in a situation like that? Well, uh, okay. So they sold a house. Who where are those people? You did, you <laughs> sold the house without, um, uh, with a broken chain of title and you insured it. So now that you insured it and you have the obligation to determine that you're delivering a, a, a chain of title that wasn't broken, but it was broken and you still insured it. You have to pay the policy. Now you have to pay the value of the property. Because you you sold you allowed you insured that again. would be to the buyer. Yeah, see that's that's what I'm saying. Who's going to do that? The new title holder is going to be so happy he just bought a house. He's not going to get into that quagmire of arguing, right? And he Have only a second has house. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, now if you could arrange it to where you see a situation like that and you help somebody out and you buy his house and you can do it, yeah, that would really help us. That's what I'm saying. Wow, we can work together and people can work together. We can we can make we can fix this. There's a lot of things we can do to fix this, but we first have to describe what's happening. You're being liquidated. Liquidated means sell all your stuff and turn it into cash and then divvy it up by someone else's will, not yours. Like you didn't have anything. John, could that be modified and used against these eminent domains that are going on with the? You yeah, you can do a receiver on them. Yeah. Receivership on them. Yeah, you could do that. You can do that. So, but what you need to do to make a to make a receivership <laughs> stick is you need to you need to uh, perfect a security interest, which you can do. You can do that with a you can do that with a security agreement. You can do that with an easement. You can do that with all kinds of things. But you need to have a perfected security interest to make it stick correctly. They're not doing that. They're lying the whole way through. There is no grounds for. There's no underlying debt. Okay, like Mocha was explaining, there's no underlying debt because the marital community is not the debtor, and there is no collective debt. Uh, so, so yeah, perfect the security interest and record on UCC one, put it in public record. That would be one thing to do. Yeah, yeah. That's Magnum. That's not twenty two long rifle. That's forty four Magnum. Yeah, there are, so, <laughs> there are so many attack vectors here. I can't even in one call talk about it. There's so many ways to to destroy this whole uh, scheme they got going in family courts. But you need to go after the judges and take their immunity and make a claim against them and or 
file a petition to appoint a receiver to liquidate their property for the compensation that you're due for what those judges did to you. Mm. And that's a lifetime. You can go back 20 years, 50 years. You should and can. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how this. <laughs> and you see liens don't require a counterparty signature. Ma'am. They do not. Right, they do not. It depends on how you do it, though. But they, you can do it so they do not require a counter signature. But anyways, yeah, that's the whole idea. Excellent. Well, that's great. It's a big part of our society right now. Um, not to mention, I mean, you have a collaboration where, like software is being used right now to, to create, um, what do you call it? Price rigging. Price rigging. In almost every part of our uh, economy, you've got price rigging. So like if you're if you're shopping for a a hotel, the price continues to go up the more you shop because of the software. Mm, mm, Whoever wrote the, wrote the software has got the hotels using the software for pricing, and then what's happening is the writer of the software, whoever's using that software and licensing out to the hotels, mm -hmm. the scheme is to just dramatically drive the prices up. I think BlackRock is behind it. Because they own everything. BlackRock owns everything. Mm -hmm. You can't avoid it. It's like when you buy consumer goods, part of that money goes to BlackRock. Mm -hmm. You're funding BlackRock. Does um, using a VPN help mitigate the price rigging no. software? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you can do your shopping and not make a trail between your visits, yeah, that will help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think it's the same with searching airline flights? Yeah. I think airline and hotel, same thing. I think there's other other services and products that are, that's the same thing being done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's where we are right now. And um, most of the pricing is artificial. It's just artificial. It, it's not natural, uh, but that's what's going to stick. I mean, I'm just looking at a deal over here in, uh, in Florida. I'm looking at a real estate deal. And I had my partner come out and he has this application on his phone where he points it at the house and he takes a picture of the house. And immediately it tells you all the debt service and everything about the house where the agents can't get any of that stuff. So what I'm, app is that? Uh, I forget. It's like home suite or something like that. But anyways, it's, it's something new. He's always got something new, but so this one, we're looking at this house as a couple of months ago and uh, we see that it was sold like a year and a half ago. And then it was sold again a, a year ago. And then it was sold four months ago. And every time it was sold, the, the sales price goes up forty to sixty thousand dollars within just a few months, and so we understand how this stuff works. So we're looking at the owners and the buyers, and and we see that they're the same people. They're just using different entities, mm -hmm. and so we figured out that it's an inst it's institutional money from Wall Street, and all these people do care about is making the value look legitimate, so they can get more money from the investment fund, and they don't care about leasing it out. Mm -hmm. It's been vacant for like six months, eight months. So we just said, okay, we're wasting our time. Let's move on. <laughs> you know? I'm not taking on that battle. I'm not going to go turn them in. I'm not going to go get them in trouble. I'm just, I don't care. I don't have time for that. But mm -hmm. just to let you know, a lot of the, most of everything is like fake. You know, it's mm -hmm. fake. But what, what I can do is um, when this, when this renders this video, um, well, Mercer can uh, upload it. Or give it to me, I'll put it on YouTube. No? <laughs> yeah, I'll give it to you, man. It's your hot potato. Okay. Well, okay. So, yeah, someone's asked me, but. No, I know. I'm... Yeah, the storm. Okay. I died. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been reborn. You know, Resurrection. I was, I was here doing this call last week, right? And then when I went to sleep, I heard the storm vaguely while I was sleeping. And when I woke up, the air was so clean and fresh. Mm. <laughs> no, but uh, it was on the coast of the Gulf Coast in Tampa and Cedar Key and up in that area that got really flooded and homes were washed away. And I, what I, from what I understand, Atlanta and Ray was saying Atlanta and then up in North Carolina. Oh, yeah. Hard. South Georgia. Too. Yeah. 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 War zone. <laughs> Yeah, and the little government. Ten minute, little 10-minute city coming there, I guess. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, the government uses it to just take everybody's property, call it a disaster area. Or something. Yeah, that's what it is. It's weather manipulation. There's about yeah. three more coming. That's Turkey. the climate change. That's the real climate change. <laughs> it is. Is the weather manipulation? Yeah. You know, a lot. If you look at climate change in terms of, there is no thing of climate change, as you guys know, but that the, we do have a trend of areas and ways in which we're polluting the environment, like microplastics in the ocean and in our food supply mm-hmm. and all that stuff, right? So we understand all that. That's or they that. pulse to, to make the storm stay a certain place. Or oh, well, they, okay, that's yeah. going on too. We know Weather that. manipulation, yeah, it is climate uh, change. If you, if you guys want to research the uh, waste that's produced by these cruise ships just off the coast of Florida, if oh. you were to remove one of those ships from the waste stream, that would compensate for the entire country's waste production, polluting the a- environment. Just one ship. It's so wow. horrible. So horrible. Oh, yeah. So we should go out of cruise ships and just go back to sailboats. Sailboats, right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we, we can, if you just change that technology, look, if you want, if you want better use of energy, then just all you have to do is modify the carburetor. Mm-hmm. People are already getting over a thousand miles per gallon in, in the 40s. Why, why are you going to have to obliterate the internal combustion engine and replace it with batteries? Mm-hmm. And why, why do you have to change? upend the entire supply chain so that kids in Africa are having to dig up sulfur. Right, right. Or whatever they're right. doing, you know? Right. Like asinine. The decisions being made are it's, yeah, it's so obviously easy. intending to, yeah. And now with 3D printers, we can modify that carburetor on the fly and make mm-hmm. it the most efficient ever. I mean, your neighbor would be getting a thousand miles per gallon, then you'll be getting 1200. Mm-hmm. Someone's going to come in 2300, you know? <laughs> Gas is free after that, okay? Right, 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 right. Yeah, but that's what they don't want to happen. Right. So use yeah. water, hydrogen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. They had an outfit up there in Alpharetta above Atlanta that was installing hydrogen units on cars. Yeah. It was a big thing, and then all of a sudden they just disappeared. Disappeared. Yeah. Yeah, I've noticed yeah, that. Shut amazing. down. Yeah. Somebody came. To, the men in black came. Mm-hmm. I saw a car in Chicago that was running straight on on straight water. Had a water tank in the trunk, a Buick. Yeah, I've it wouldn't that. pass the emission test, John. That's they had to, they had to get it to run on gas to get a, a inspection sticker, emission sticker. Then he would flip the switch and go back to water. It wouldn't. The computer could not. Of course, that's ridiculous. Wow. Well, okay, but now uh, what you shared tonight is everybody should lay awake thinking about this. What you shared tonight is, is phenomenal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, it's it's kind of shocking, uh, but there are there's a solution, and we have to take responsibility. We have to do some work because we haven't been. So now we have mm-hmm. to because we want to fix things and fix things for our children. Um, a quick fix is a post nuptial in the in the divorce cases. Okay. Yeah. We're talking about the state involved in your business. Okay. Right. Divorce or an agreement. Make an agreement. Yeah, agreements. You know, we can use arbitration to mm-hmm. avoid trial court in many cases. So think about these things and what yeah. kind of arbitration are we talking about? I'm not talking about your corporate arbitration. I'm talking right. about where you agree that if there's a dispute, you're going to sit down together and try to revise the agreement, number one, or you're going to get with some friends or some strangers and convene an arbitration panel. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, there's things we can do. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen with cryptos. Okay. It's not. I don't know. You got they're priced in dollars, right? I mean, that's what you care about. So I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how the political parties affect the value of cryptos, the pricing of cryptos. I could I could tell you what you guys know already. The longer you hold them, the better it's going to be. It's just like anything else. The question is, do you is that a good use of capital? I've talked to people before who would tell me, I have been holding gold for 20 years. And I tell them, Well, you're still poor then, aren't you? Because <laughs> that does no good whatsoever. You missed, missed, missed all kinds of opportunities by holding goals for so long. It's too long. It's too long. So take some of your gold and buy some assets. Yeah, gold is insurance. Gold is a way to settle transactions. It's not, I mean, yeah, okay, it's money. Yeah, 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 it's money. But it's not what we're using. And trust me, you don't want to use gold for things. You want to use credit. We're stuck here. I don't know how to get out of it. We're stuck in a feudal system. I don't know any better system because I'll give you an example and I'll, and I'll, this will be the end, I, I think. The example is how the Amish, you know, do a barn raising. What is that? That's where people, yeah, the people in the community use the credit of other people. 
that other people take their time and labor and resources mm -hmm. and help another member of the community build a barn. Mm -hmm. Why? And it's an investment in their community. Well, it is. But why would they do that? Because someone did that for them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that has value. We can mm -hmm. accept that. Mm -hmm. That's called a loan. Mm -hmm. And it's and a teaching opportunity and it helps yeah. the kids learn how to do it. And there's a lot about that event that is so, huge as well as the party aspect. The bankers came in and took that that scenario and turned and commercialized it. Mm -hmm. And and now it's it's exploiting us. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we can't we can't get away from that. We're, we're in order to get things done, somebody has to start something. Like if I'm going to start a business, I, I have to take my time and I have to spend some money that I already have or borrow from somebody else to go collect resources and arrange something to start making money. In most cases, and, and, do I get a paycheck for that? Mostly not. I might go a few years without a paycheck. For that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's my credit. I'm, I'm, you know, working that way. So we're just, that's how we, that's our, our, species i guess if you will okay so gold is not going to help us because you're now you have something of value that's already you're moving it around you want you want loan money the problem we have with the loan system is that it's exploiting people it's deliberately being used to exploit people anyways Thanks so much, guys. And uh, we'll, yeah. we'll do this again. Mocha, let's do this again this way. I think it worked out pretty well. Okay. Just at least next week, because I am going to be hiking, but I am going to be on this call. Okay. That's my intent. And I'm available on phone. So we still have technology, even if I'm out in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> All work. right. I'll try to be well, I'm going to stop the recording, and then uh, you tell me later how it went, what you want. <laughs> okay. How you All want right, it. Put the bow on it. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. All right. yeah, thank you. Are, are we going to do that UCC thing today? No. Yeah, do you want to talk about that? No, I'm tired. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do. Why? Because today a bad day. Today is today a bad day. Because you're you're golf camping. Yeah, so. let's, do it, let's do it next week where we're going to be a tutorial. Yeah. I, I think right. there was too much interest last time, right? Moco? Yeah, there was. Yeah, there was has lot. everybody got their UCC? I mean, have they got their agreements? Did they, they go in and get it? Is, do we have a group to start moving forward? Yeah, does anybody want to do that? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, oh, I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to stop All the right. recording. And I've got to take off, though. I'll let